This is Thursday, January 8, 2015. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Maureen Sullivan. Our cameraman is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus, and we are privileged to have with us today Frank Chip Sinclair. Welcome, Chip. Thank you. May I ask when you were born? January 22nd, 1952. And where were you born? Framingham, Mass. Uh, did you spend any time in Framingham? No. I lived in Natick my whole life. And your current address is? Natick. Your marital status? I'm a widower. Do you have children? Yes, I have three sons. And do you have grandchildren? I do. I have four grandsons and another grandson due in March. Okay. I also have three step-granddaughters. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Tell us what Natick was like growing up. Well, it was much different than it is today. Uh, it was most of the kids grew up and played with all the kids in their own neighborhood, their community. and. Uh, all of your schools had playgrounds that were run by your playground directors were high school kids that worked for the parks department in the summer, and which would be their summer jobs. And they all had, you know, softball teams that would compete against other playgrounds, like Johnson School would compete against Lilger or Lincoln. And uh, you're your activities were pretty much all of the, the neighborhoods, whether it would be playing softball or basketball or whatever at Johnson or skating in the winter down at Coolidge Field, uh, sledding at Coolidge Hill or Johnson School. And very few families had summer homes like they do today, either at the, down at the Cape or up on the North Shore or Maine, New Hampshire, whatever. Okay, Chip, tell us a bit about your parents. My mom was born and raised in Union, Maine, and my dad was born in Buffalo, New York, but lived most of his life either in Woburn, Mass., or Medfield, Mass., and my dad's mother was a, a nurse at the Medfield State Hospital, and then he had joined the Mass National Guard in the 30s, and then when the war broke out, they got activated, and he was sent to Iceland with the Mass National Guard, and he spent four years over in Europe fighting the Germans. And he was an engineer, and after the war, he had gone to work for an outfit in Cambridge as an electrotyper. And my mother had worked there as a secretary while she was going to school, and that's how my mom and dad met. You mentioned er before the interview came from a family of 10. Yes. And you have uh, three brothers? Six brothers. Six brothers. Six brothers and three sisters. And did anyone else serve in the military? Yes. My brother Bobby served 20 years in the Army. My brother Kenny did 20 years in the Army. My brother Albert did 20 years in the Army. And I myself did four years in the Navy and 16 years in the Mass National Guard. When uh, did you go to Natick schools growing up? Yes. I graduated from Natick High in 1970. Did you go into the military after that? Yes. Uh, right after high school, uh, I didn't attend college, and I, there was very few jobs in the 70s, and I knew I was going to get drafted, and because uh, the draft was going pretty heavily at the time. And I figured, well, I might as well look into joining the Navy, and I just felt that that was probably my best bet for some kind of an education or some type of training. Why the Navy and not follow your brothers into the Army? Well, I really didn't have any desire to go into the Army, go into the infantry, so uh, I, I had looked into the different training uh, opportunities, and I felt that the Navy gave me the best opportunities at the time. And tell us a little bit about 
this is now late 60s, early 70s, Vietnam War was still going on. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us a little bit about uh, what that time was like. Well, at the time, the country was very anti-military. They, uh, you know, that was during the, the peace and love generation, the flower children. And, and uh, they just, they didn't like the military. They were against the Vietnam War. There was a lot of protests throughout the country and it was just a bad time if you were in the military. You were really looked down upon. So when and where did you join the Navy? Well, I was actually sitting right over here in Natick Common one afternoon, <clears throat> and I, like I said, I, I knew I was going to get drafted. So I had gone up to the Framingham, and I had talked to a Navy recruiter, and uh, like I said earlier, there was very few jobs around, and I was just getting tired. I, I wasn't going to sit there and wait to get drafted, so I figured if, if I join, at least I have a little bit of say as to where I may end up instead of just getting drafted and going straight into the infantry. So I went up to Framingham and talked to a recruiter, and I took a bunch of aptitude tests, and they said I was very strong in you know, engineering, so that's how I ended up in the Navy. <laughs> where were you sent for basic? I went to Great Lakes, Illinois, January 24th, 1971. Tell us what basic was like. It was long and cold. The, uh, the days of marching around out during basic training, going from classroom to classroom, it was very, very cold. <laughs> I just, I remember the ice and everything on the sidewalks and it, uh, it was long, and we had a lot of classroom, a lot of, uh, of course, we were in the Navy, so there was a lot of simulations on board ship, um, jumping in these big pools, of swimming pools, to simulate jumping off the side of a ship, and the proper way to jump off the ship, you didn't just jump. You, you had to cross your, your arms a certain way and your legs a certain way, and they taught you how to make a life vest out of your pants and a life vest out of your shirt and how to take them off while you're in the water so you don't sink and how to use them so, you know, to make a flotation device so you, you could float. Now, is this your first time away from home long-term? Yes, term? my very first, yes. And uh, the homesickness was tremendous. It was, it was quite an experience, actually. And uh, the first time away from home, and all of a sudden, you realize that you can't, there's nobody there to lean on, like mom and dad. All of a sudden, you're on your own. And uh, it, was, it was quite an experience. It was an eye-opener. Did you get to meet people from other parts of the country? Oh, yeah. yeah. You met people from all over, you know, from... Wisconsin, uh, down south, the the west, the Midwest. There, there's, it's, it was uh, it was quite an experience learning how everybody's upbringing was different and mm -hmm. what you thought was was hard, they thought was easy. Well, aside from learning how to jump off ships and learning <laughs> how to make life vests out of your uh, pants and uh, shirts, did you receive any uh, additional training? Well, actually, when I had left boot camp, I reported to my first ship, and uh, I was uh, going to go on to uh, training for to become a machinist mate. And because of the fact that we, the ship was so short-handed, we, we just weren't allowed to go to school. We had to pretty much learn on the job. So I reported on board ship and went straight to the engine room. So tell us what that was like. 
That was, uh, that was tough. I, I got to the ship and I remember the first day going down to the engine room. They opened up the, the hatch to go down and it felt like I was walking into a sauna. It was like a blast furnace. And it was roughly 110 to 115 degrees down in the engine rooms daily. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I don't know how I, I did four years down there, but we did. <laughs> Hopefully you lost a lot of weight. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't see too many heavy guys down there. Mm. So in the engine room, do you remember what sort of duties you performed? Yeah, I used to run the, uh, what was called the, the throttles. You had two big, huge valve wheels in front of you. And one was the forward and one was the stern. So that was to go the, either forward or to have the ship go back. And uh, we, we had my first ship was an old ship commissioned in 1943. And it still had the wooden decks up top. And it had a 1,200 pound uh, steam system. So you, uh, if you ha developed a leak in a line, you couldn't see the steam because it was so hot. So you would have to take like a broom handle and pass it across any joints that were pipes were joined together to see if the leak was there. And if it was, it would cut the broom handle in half, but you couldn't see it. And w the reason for the broom handle was if your hand or fingers or anything touched it, it would cut your fingers off. Wow. So it was, uh, you know, it was, it was, it was stuff like that on a daily basis. And, uh, and what was the name of the ship? Uh, the USS Little Rock. CLG-4. And what kind of a ship was it? A cruiser. Cruiser light guided. And you uh, mentioned on the job training, uh, so uh, were you at sea? Oh yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. I reported, uh, I left boot camp and I reported down in Norfolk, Virginia to pick up the ship and we left Norfolk and went on a six-month cruise to the Med. Med and being the Mediterranean. Med being the Mediterranean, yes. And we went to, uh, uh, we went to Naples, we were in uh, Spain, Greece, uh, France, we went all around there. It was, it was quite a trip. It was, it was a nice trip. Well, not bad for uh, somebody just fresh out of Natick Mass. Not bad, not bad at all. <laughs> so this brings us to maybe around 1970? Around 72. And then uh, while we were over in the Med, we had got orders from the state side to, we, to come home and we were to report to South Carolina. They were cutting us orders to go to Vietnam. So we are down in South Carolina taking on ammo, and then they had changed our orders again. And they had sent our sister ship, which was the USS Newport News to Vietnam. We picked up the second fleet flag, and we had gone back and we went to the North Atlantic on this time. So we were up into England, Norway, Amsterdam, Denmark, Finland, up inside the fjords. It was, a, it was a great trip. And it wasn't in Vietnam. <laughs> it was in Vietnam and uh -huh. it was not quite as dangerous. <laughs> okay. Uh, were you still a machinist mate? Yes, yes. Anything else you remember from your first two voyages? Well, there was one time, yes, one time when we were coming, actually when we were coming home from the Med, we, uh, we had hit a hurricane coming home. So that was quite an experience. I mean, the, the cruiser I was on was a, it was big. It was a long, long ship. But we were out in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean and we felt like a little toy boat in a bathtub bouncing around in that hurricane. And it gives you an appreciation as to just how powerful 
Mother Nature really is. So how long were you in the North Atlantic? We were up there for three months. And what happened after that? Well, then we came home and we went to, uh, we went back down to Newport, Rhode Island, and we were going back to the Med. We were gonna be stationed in Gaeta, Italy. And uh, at this time I was married and so I, requested a transfer and I got my transfer and they sent me to uh, Mayport, Florida to pick up another ship. And where is Mayport? Right in Jacksonville, Florida. So you were right at the Naval Air Station? Yes, yes. Okay. They were closed in Newport, Rhode Island at the time. So they were taking all the ships out of Newport and sending them elsewhere. What did you do down in Mayport? Same thing. I was a machinist mate again. This time I was on a destroyer escort, though, not a cruiser. It's a much smaller ship. And what's the name? The USS Capadonna, DE-1093. And what happened with the Capadonna? Well, I was uh, actually what was called a plank owner, meaning I was a member of the very first crew to report to this ship, and uh, she was named after a lieutenant, a Marine Corps lieutenant in Vietnam who was a chaplain, and he had gotten killed in Vietnam. And uh, so we went down, you know, we went on our sea trials, like down to Cuba, and you know, down in that area. And, Pretty much that, that took me almost up to my uh, four years and they were getting ready to pull out on a cruise and I had only had, oh, maybe three months left. And by the time the cruise was gonna be completed, you know, I would have already been out, so they sent me home instead. So I didn't go on the cruise with them. And home as in Natacombe? Home as in Natacombe, out of the military. While you were um, with the Navy, did you earn any medals or accommodations? Just the, uh, you know, your regular, uh, nothing special, no, mm -hmm. just the regular medals and accommodations that you get for being in. Mm -hmm. Are there any uh, memorable characters or other incidents from your time in the Navy? Well, uh, yeah, there was a few. There was a couple of guys that were some real characters, you know. But, uh, you know, there's, I, I do remember like one instance, uh, we were over in the Med and we, we damaged what was called the main spring bearing. In, it was just a massive, massive bearing that goes over the shaft, and it's in two pieces. And we got to change this thing. Well, it's in tight quarters, and it was behind the boiler. Mm -hmm. And you're always, like, hunched over. You couldn't stand up. And we started, and then all of a sudden they told, that's when they told us, once you start this job, you can't stop until it's completed. Well, Jesus, it took... 30 hours to do this thing. You gotta hook up all these, you know, block and tackles and chain falls and it was, mm -hmm. I mean, it was stifling hot. You had to do it in shifts and I was just, I mean, you come out of that and we, we must have lost 20 pounds each just <laughs> working on this thing for that time. But uh, it was, it was, it was tough, you know. It wasn't something I would want to do again. Okay. That's why you do it when you're young. All right, so you've ended your tour duty in the Navy. You're back in Natick. Tell us what happened next. Well, my, my wife had come home about two or three months before I did to find us a place to live. So when I got home, she had found us an apartment over on, right off of Pond Street. And uh, I got out in December of 74, and then in February of 75, I started working at the Natick Labs. And uh, 
you know, that's when we pretty much just kind of settled in Natick and I started attending night school on my GI Bill and well, it was probably about a year after I got out, I joined the National Guard, which I never thought I would, but I did. And geez, lo and behold, I ended up spending 16 years in the National Guard. Mm -hmm. uh, this is Army National Guard? Yes. Okay. And what did you uh, do at the labs? I worked in the power plant. I went right back to boilers. And then tell us a little, I mean, you were uh, born and raised in Natick. Yes. And what, um, what, what did you hear about the labs growing up? You know, back then it was called the Quartermasters, and uh, I can remember as a kid, we used to go there on their, they used to have like a, a field day or an open day or whatever, mm -hmm. and you we were always amazed when you go in and you see the, the parachutes hanging in the, you know, in those big rooms and the food that they made. And, but I, you know, I never dreamed I'd ever end up working there. That's mm -hmm. for sure. But it was always an interesting place. Mm -hmm. It was, it's not your typical military post. And it still wasn't. <laughs> and it still isn't. It's all a bunch of doctors and research scientists. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. So what made you join the, Na the Army National Guard? Well, my older brother Bobby actually, he was in the uh, Army Reserves and uh, he had said to me, you know, you ought to think about joining the Reserves. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a, you know, you do one weekend a month and you, it's a nice little part-time job. So that's how I ended up in the Reserves. Did you feel a bit different going in from Navy to Army? Much, <laughs> much different, yeah. The only reason why I didn't do the Navy, actually, was I would have had to travel all the way down to Newport, Rhode Island, and uh, with the National Guard unit right here in Natick. I mean, it's only five minutes from my house, mm -hmm. so that was pretty much the reason why I did the Mass National Guard instead of the Navy. And what did you do for the National Guard? I worked in uh, maintenance, like I was a tech supply, kind of almost like a, a pot supply, like a, you know, uh, like an ADAP. We, we, I drove trailer truck and we used to have all of the parts in the, in the trucks and we would transport all the parts out into the, well, the field, out in the woods, wherever the units were. And what kind of traveling did you do? Uh, we, we used to travel up to uh, Watertown, New York. Uh, we, we used to go to the Cape quite often, uh, Fort Devens. Pretty much just local area. You Not know, to the fjords you know. of Norway. No, <laughs> no, no, nothing like that. At any time during your 16 years, was the unit ever called into action? Actually, the first Gulf War, we were on alert. So we were actually the next unit to be called when the Gulf War ended. So I guess you could say I dodged the bullet twice. We were taking on ammo for Vietnam and then we <laughs> were on, you know, on call to get ready to go to the Gulf. And what rank did you hail? E6, E6, Staff Sergeant. And when did you leave the National Guard? Oh, geez, let me see. I've been out since 1994, I think, mm -hmm. somewhere around there. And are you still working for the labs? No, I'm retired. Mm -hmm. Now, Chip, did you join any service organizations? I, I belong to the American Legion. I belong to the AMVETS, I belong to the VFW, I'm a member of the DAV, the Disabled American Veterans, so yeah, quite a, quite a bit of them. Uh -huh. uh, how did you uh, become disabled? My legs. 
I, I've mm -hmm. damaged my legs while I was in the military. I've had, mm -hmm. I've had about 13 surgeries on my legs. What happened? Knees. Mm. They just, they're not designed to kneel on <laughs> bricks and cement floors or whatever. Well, did you, uh, were they damaged during your Navy time or your yes. time? Yes, yes, yeah. Navy. Working with broken mainsprings and stuff <laughs> like that. Okay. Working down the engine rooms. Chip, how important has it been for you to serve in the military? Very much. Uh, I, I take a great deal of pride, you know, doing my military duty. And uh, it, it makes you realize that there's a lot more than just Natick Mass. And you go out there and you, you meet a lot of good friends. I actually have some friends that I st still stay in contact with. And... Uh, it's, it gives you a good feeling knowing that you served your country. That, uh, as, as they say, freedom isn't free. And there's a lot of people that have sacrificed the ultimate mm -hmm. for that freedom. Chip, mm -hmm. did you want to um, mention anything more about your brothers who served in the Army? Well, my, my brother Bobby did a hitch in Vietnam, and he came home. He, he was wounded twice. and My brother Kenny has done a hitch in Iraq. He was sent to Iraq at, he was like 53 years old when he was sent to Iraq. And so, uh, you know, it's, we've, my family has, has done their, when the, the call came out, they, they answered the call. So. How about your sons? None of my sons have, have uh, gone into the military, no. Okay. Chip, is there anything else? No, I think we pretty much covered it, Maureen. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, Frank, Chip, Sinclair, we thank you so much for coming and taking part in the Natick Veterans Oral History Project. My pleasure. Thank you. Mm -hmm.